Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. That footage was from the 1968 Apollo space launch that eventually resulted in landing a man on the moon, one of the proudest American achievements of the 20th century. But did you know that some of Nazi Germany's top scientists were critical to this project? Good morning, I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. After World War II, the United States government rolled out the welcome mat to some 1,600 German scientists who had previously developed deadly weapons for Nazi Germany. Today, we will discuss America's shifting national interests during World War II and the competing factors that led to this secret operation. We will also share details of another closely guarded intelligence mission at that time, which brought European Jewish refugees now serving in the American military in direct contact with individuals who had been complicit with the Nazi regime. It's my pleasure to welcome two guests who will shed light on this fascinating and complex chapter of history. Dr. Robert Sutton is the author of the book, Nazis on the Potomac, the top secret intelligence operation that helped win World War II. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Edna. And I would also like to welcome my colleague and fellow historian, Dr. Mark Alexander, who will help us understand America's motivations in recruiting these German scientists and other experts after the war. Hi there, Mark. Good morning. Glad to have you both. And viewers, during the show, please send us your questions for Bob and Mark by posting them in the comments area, and we will get to as many as we can during the course of the live program. Bob, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, while World War II played out in Europe, there was a secret military intelligence operation underway here in the US that eventually brought Jewish refugees who had escaped Europe in direct contact with men who had served the Nazi regime. What was it? Tell us about it. During the 1930s, uh, a number of Jewish refugees came to the United States. Uh, some came with their families, some came individually. Uh, they were settled in, but when Pearl Harbor happened, most of them were very, very anxious to join the army or the Navy so they could try to get even with Hitler who had pushed them out of their homeland. <clears throat> They initially they they could not join because there was a they were classified as enemy aliens because the the country was at war against uh, against Germany. Eventually, Germany rescinded Jewish uh, citizens citizenship, and they now could join or be drafted. And many of them, because they spoke German, because they were natives of German. They understood not only the language, but the nuances. They understood the culture. And they were perfect for being involved in intelligence uh, to, uh, for the war effort against, uh, against Germany. <clears throat> Some of them um, actually were, were assigned to, most of, most of them were assigned to uh, Europe to interrogate prisoners uh, in, the war, in the war areas. But some were sent to a, to a fort near Washington, D.C., Fort Hunt. Uh, it had been in, it had been there for a long time, but now it was converted into a secret operation. Um, here you can see the, uh, the 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 prison area. Uh, they brought the high the highest level Nazis here for interrogation, uh, among other things. Uh, it was top secret. Uh, in fact, the name of it no longer was Fort Hunt. It was referred to as Post Office Box 1142. Um, prisoners were brought into the camp usually at night in a bus with blacked out windows. Uh, they were sworn, all these men who were assigned there were sworn to secrecy. They couldn't tell their families and they also uh, were not allowed to say anything after the war. And these were Germans <clears throat> who had been captured uh, or had surrendered. This is while the war is still going on. <clears throat> um, but now, and have a little water if you need. 
Bob, I know my allergies are acting up, so I'm, I'm doing that, that throat clearing too. Um, as you said, they were sworn to secrecy even once the operation concluded, but now, so many decades later, the <laughs> secret is out. And I know that you have had a chance while working with the National Park Service to interview about 60 of these veterans um, once they were finally able to speak freely about their work at Fort Hunt in the state of Virginia. Introduce us, please, to a man named Rudolph Pins. Rudy Pins was uh, born in, and was raised in a small town in Germany, Oakster, Hoekster, Germany. Uh, when he was young, um, he said that he was the, his family was the only Jewish family in the town, but it really didn't matter. Um, he was, had friends, his family had friends. Uh, it was if he, it, it really didn't matter whether he was Jewish or, or anything else. But when Hitler came to power, things began to change. Initially, he really uh, wasn't aware of all the changes. Um, but in 1934, uh, he went to school one day and his teacher took him aside and said, uh, Rudy, you're not going to be able to go on the field trip this weekend. He said, why not? He said, because you're Jewish. Well, this is the first time that he really, really encountered the Nazi anti-Semitism. Unbeknownst to him, um, his family had been working to try to find out if, first of all, if they could get out of Germany at the time. But if not, they wanted to find out if he could leave. And he was sent uh, on a, in a program for children under 16 <clears throat> to a foster family in Cleveland. And there he settled. Now, his family allowed him to do this because most, probably most German Jewish families thought Hitler was an aberration. They thought, you know, he'll be voted out of office. He won't be there very long. But in this case, uh, they, they allowed him to go. But when he left, um, in, in 1934. He didn't know it, but that would be the last time that he ever saw his family. And we actually have this photo here, uh, the gentleman on the left in the hat and glasses with his face um, towards the camera is actually Rudy's father, uh, Dr. Leo Pins, um, during his deportation from a train station uh, to somewhere east. Um, so a very, very sad personal story. Um, but then Rudy had to make his way. He went from being a young teenager living with his family uh, to suddenly being alone in a foreign country. When was he drafted into the American military and what did he do at Fort Hunt? Well, he was drafted in 1943. Actually, he was in college at the time. Um, he was drafted and sent to Fort Hunt. And when he was at Fort Hunt, he, he was involved in a program in which the high value uh, Nazi prisoners were interrogated. And they also, uh, there was also a listening system, uh, microphone system set out throughout the uh, fort that you saw in the earlier picture that picked up conversations of prisoners, both in their, in their quarters, in their rooms and throughout uh, the fort. So he did both uh, interrogation and uh, monitoring. Now, he was there for about two and a half years, and in that time, he became very adept at interviewing prisoners. In fact, when he left, he said he could tell in about five or ten minutes whether the prisoner would have any value or not. But he and everyone else who was stationed at Fort Hunt who interrogated prisoners made it abundantly clear that they never, ever tortured. They never used corporal punishment on any of the prisoners that came through the fort. That said, it didn't mean that they didn't have tools to use um, to gain information. So one of, the, one of the things that they did, there were two Russian-American soldiers who were stationed at Fort Hunt. They were dressed in Red Army uniforms. They, of course, spoke Russian. They had very thick Russian accents. So a prisoner said, I don't want to tell you anything, or just would clam up. They'd say, that's fine. Uh, one of these men would come into the room uh, it would be very conspicuous, and they would say, well, if you don't want to say anything to us, how about if we have Ivan here take you to the Soviet Union, and why don't you see what they have to say? So uh, that actually worked about 80% of the time, both in uh, Fort Hunt and elsewhere. So they had, um, they didn't use violence, but they had both kind of carrots and sticks <clears throat> um, right. for, for getting people to talk. Um, I understand that Rudy also would uh, basically eavesdrop on some of these prisoners that they had placed listening devices right throughout the camp. Yes, and they had a they had a very elaborate system. 
uh, that had they had microphones all throughout the, the fort. Uh, usually, at any given time, there'd be about twelve soldiers um, total that were listening to conversations all around the fort. Generally, the best the, the times when they get the best information was right after uh, an interrogation. They pay very careful attention because sometimes the the uh, prisoner would come back to the room and his his roommate or roommates would ask him what he said, and they could sometimes ferret out some information from that. But one of the things that worked very, very well, some of the German prisoners made it very clear that they didn't like what was going on in the war with Germany, and they decided that they would become collaborators with the Americans, and they actually were stool pigeons. They actually would room with some of the soldiers, and that's where they got the very best information in this eavesdropping program. Pretty sophisticated uh, endeavor. I want to pause for a moment to welcome and greet our viewers from all around the world. Uh, first here in the U.S., we wish you good morning in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, thank you for watching from DeKalb, Illinois, Mission, Texas, and Wichita, Texas. And we are also glad to have people watching from around the world, including Sintra, Portugal, and Colombia in Latin America. So thank you for being with us. Um, Bob, please tell us about another German Jewish refugee soldier, a man named Paul Fairbrook. How old was he when he came to the United States? Well, he was a teenager when he came to the United States, but his family actually had left uh, Germany when he was 10 years old. His father was a very successful banker. He didn't like what was going on in Germany. And so in 1933, he took the family to, to uh, Palestine. They went from there to uh, the Netherlands and eventually to the United States. Uh, they settled in New York. He was actually working when Pearl Harbor uh, took place. Uh, Paul Fairbrook was working when Pearl Harbor took place. And um, he was, he eventually, he was one of the ones who tried to join uh, the army right after Pearl Harbor, but he was turned down because he was an enemy alien, but eventually he was drafted. And when he was drafted, as was true of many of these German Jewish uh, soldiers, uh, their commander would hear their accent and they'd say, you know, he could be more useful to us probably doing something other than shooting guns um, at the enemy. So um, he and others were sent to a place in, uh, in Maryland called uh, Camp Ritchie. And Camp Ritchie was the, uh, was the training center for intelligence. In, in, uh, and you can see here, uh, to give you a flavor of what it was like, if, if you would have walked by, if you would have somehow stumbled onto to Camp uh, Ritchie, at this time, you probably would have thought it was a German cell because many of the American soldiers were dressed up in, Jun Jun in German uniforms. In this case, they have someone dressed up as Hitler doing a, a, a speech to the men. So uh, this, was the, this was one of the main training centers. So they were doing sort of simulations, practice runs, um, making sure that people were familiar, not only with the culture, but with situations they might find themselves in once in Europe, right? Right. Paul was actually one of many thousands of soldiers who served at Camp Ritchie, uh, who became affectionately known as the Ritchie Boys. And earlier this month, the museum presented its highest honor, the Elie Wiesel Award to the Ritchie Boys for their unique role in advancing the Allied victory over Nazi Germany. Uh, later at the end of the show, we'll share a link to a program that we produced focusing just on the Ritchie Boys and other Jewish refugees who served overseas. So against this backdrop, how did Paul, once he left Fort, uh, left Camp Ritchie, apply his intelligence training at Fort Hunt, the place that you had taken us to earlier? Well, he went to Fort Hunt uh, in a program that dealt with documents, captured documents. And he had a very funny thing to say. He said uh, that every time a German sneezed, there was a document to, to document it. Uh, about, 150, about 150 tons of documents came through Fort Ritchie uh, when they came in, they were delegated to different people. Uh, someone had a specialty in the SS, another had a specialty in German youth, another had a specialty in newspapers and so forth and so on. So each one had a specialty. Uh, they were became very, very good at what they were doing. Uh, and one of the major uh, publications that came out of this program what was called the Red Book, uh, very simply because it had a red cover. But it was the order of battle of the German army, and it it was enormously helpful to the troops in Europe uh, the, when they were planning for D-Day 
and uh, for the soldiers who were interrogating uh, German prisoners in Europe. I could go on and describe it, but Paul himself does a far better job of describing what the Red Book was that he helped produce. This book was prepared so that the American boys who were the interrogators would have this book in their possession. And when they interviewed a prisoner, and he said, for instance, that he might have been in the uh, 89th Infantry Division. I would tell him who the commander was. I told him in what district it was, what regiments they had, everything about them, because that was in the book. So if the interrogator knew that, then the person being interrogated would know, well, he knows an awful lot. I might as well tell him the rest of it. So it really gave them that sort of insider feel. Um, Bob, we have a question from a viewer named Brad. He's asking, when was the secret mission that these Jewish refugee soldiers participated in declassified? Uh, well, it was started to be declassified. It's kind of a long story. I don't want to get too far into it, but uh, the, the uh, started to be declassified in the 70s. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, one who was stationed at Fort Hunt in another program wrote a book uh, about what happened in his program. That was another program that I didn't describe. Uh, and the army was so upset about it, they tried to buy up all the copies of the book <laughs> before it got on the on the press. But really, by the 1990s, uh, it was it was fully declassified, and uh, we started uh, talking to these uh, soldiers who were stationed there in about 2006. We uh, interviewed about 65 who were there uh, between 2006 and 2010. So many decades later. Um, and I understand that Rudy and Paul and their comrades took great pride in their contributions, both uh, being able to contribute as proud new Americans and also to help defeat the, the country that had, um, you know, caused their lives to disintegrate and in many cases caused them to lose their family. Uh, I'd like to bring Mark into the conversation. He's been waiting very patiently um, and help us uh, get some other context here. Um, as World War II, Mark was coming to an end. The American government perspectives and priorities began to shift. Um, what were some of the competing uh, pressures at play? Uh, uh, well, as the war in Europe was winding down and Nazi Germany was collapsing, um, some American policymakers uh, began to focus on how they could quickly end the war against Japan in the Pacific and how they could best prepare for any future conflicts. Um, in the last stages of the war, the alliance between the Soviet Union and the United States was starting to fray, and it began to seem clear to many officials that these two powers would emerge as future rivals, and uh, it seemed likely that to uh, some that they would even be going uh, into uh, to, to war with each other, open hostilities, just within a matter of years. Uh, and so in this environment, uh, these allies uh, began to uh, race to kind of snatch up top German scientists that might be able to provide them with uh, some of Nazi Germany's advanced military technologies and so gain a sort of an edge uh, in any future conflict. Uh, the American effort, the secret program to do this was known as Operation Paperclip, uh, so-called apparently because uh, a small little paperclip would be placed on the personal files of these German experts and scientists that were deemed necessary for this, uh, this effort uh, as a kind of a signal that uh, nobody should look too closely into their backgrounds and they should be approved really quickly. It was deemed very urgent. So seeing a very quick shift, um, sort of the phenomenon of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yes, uh, exactly. Bob, some of the Jewish refugee soldiers in the cohort that you've been describing were directly affected by this change and this idea that, wait a minute, we need to actually uh, rely on some German expertise. Could you please tell us about a Ritchie boy named Arno Mayer and how this new mission uh, came to shape his role in America's military? Arno Mayer was uh, actually from Luxembourg. He was not from Germany. Uh, his family was able, to, his father got a tip that the Germans would be attacking uh, and his family literally left the night before the Germans rolled into the low country. Uh, made their way to the United States. He was actually quite a bit younger than many of the soldiers who were uh, at Fort Hunt. When, by the time he was drafted, the war was really winding down. Uh, it was almost over. And so when he came to Fort Hunt, uh, the war was over and the role had changed. Now, the German soldiers, or the Germans who came in, 
were many, in many cases, scientists or politicians or even generals who came in. And now it was, they were gearing up, the United States was gearing up for the potential Cold War with the Soviet Union. And uh, so now they, instead of uh, interrogating them, they would do a little bit of interrogation to try to determine whether or not they would be loyal to the United States. But mostly they wanted to encourage them to stay in the United States. So the role of Arno Mayer and others, they were called morale officers. And their role was to try to keep these uh, German folks happy so that they would stay in the United States. So one of his jobs was to bring them newspapers, make sure that they had plenty of food, plenty of drink, uh, that they were entertained. And uh, is again, a completely different role from what it had been uh, just, just very shortly, a couple of years before. And we'd like to thank Arno Mayer and his family for sharing some of these family photos we've just been seeing of Arno during this time. Um, you mentioned that his title was morale officer. What does that mean? What did it mean to be a morale officer? Well, it essentially meant to do anything, anything within reason um, to make these folks happy. And one thing that he was asked to do that was, um, I think, very distasteful to him, uh, he was asked to take a, a group of scientists to uh, a local department store in Washington, D.C. to buy a uh, to buy things for their families in Germany. They said their families were suffering in Germany and they needed to buy some things for them. He chose, uh, I think on purpose, to take them to a store called Landsberg and Brother, which was a Jewish department store that had actually been around even before the Civil War. There they bought all kinds of things, um, and uh, but they were dressed in uh, their, their long, uh, leather coats and Tyrolean hats. They really looked like they were Gestapo. They spoke German. Rudy himself was in a uniform without any insignias. Uh, eventually, the, the MPs were called. They came in. He had to straighten things out, which he did. They were able to send all of their materials to Germany. But this did not set well with him, that he was required to take these folks to spend a lot of taxpayer money on uh, accommodating what they felt was important. And he certainly, you know, had his own little tiny rebellion by taking them to a Jewish owned department store. But on a day to day basis, he's getting them newspapers, he's making small talk, he's getting them whiskey. And it, it certainly must have been an uncomfortable role to have to play. Um, let's listen to Arno in his own words in a clip from a recent documentary called Camp Confidential, where he talks about uh, how it felt to be this morale officer. Behind my back, he referred to me as the kleine Judenbube, the little Jew boy. You know, in your best dreams or nightmares, you couldn't have expected to become the morale officer of these high animals. I mean, the hatred in, within me was so strong, I couldn't, I couldn't resist it. And the only question that I asked myself is, what did they do during the war? And as he said, he, he could not know precisely what they had done in the service of Nazi Germany. Um, but the US government knew without a doubt that some of the people that they were now recruiting and cultivating had dirty hands. Um, how is Operation Paperclip viewed today, Mark? Uh, well, it, it remains controversial, uh, like many secret government operations. Uh, uh, many people believe that the information the scientific knowledge, the military technology that was gained by working with these figures was extremely valuable and uh, was even a military necessity at the time. But uh, as the years have gone by, more and more details have emerged about exactly uh, what some of these uh, Germans recruited in Operation Paperclip had done under the Nazi regime. And many of them were uh, guilty of war crimes. And so uh, as more information has come out, I think more people agree that Operation Paperclip is uh, at least morally questionable. Well, let's put a face to some of these um, moral compromises and talk about one scientist who was um, directly even a convicted war criminal. Tell us about Otto Ambrose. Yes, Otto Ambrose. Uh, he was a very influential chemist. Uh, he was a, a member of the board of the notorious German chemical company, IG Farben, and helped design the IG Farben factory at, the, uh, at Auschwitz. Uh, 
he was also the manager there for several years and oversaw uh, the use of concentration camp prisoners forced labor. Uh, after the war, he was convicted uh, and sentenced to eight years for his involvement in the exploitation of that forced, forced labor. Uh, and yet just about two and a half years into his sentence, uh, he was granted clemency. His sentence was overturned by US officials. He was put on an operation paperclip list uh, and he went on to significant post-war success. He became a very wealthy man. Uh, he advised the US Department of Energy. He was on the board of many, many large companies uh, and, and had a, a really, really successful post-war career in spite of his crimes under the Nazi, Nazi regime. So basically his technical skills as a chemist, and I understand he was involved not only in the exploitation of slave labor, but also in the development of nerve gases like sarin. Yes. Um, he, he got a slap on the wrist and uh, went on to have a great career. Um, Mark, I'd like to turn to another scientist, uh, a name that some of our viewers may recognize, but whose connection to the Nazis also was downplayed. What can you tell us about uh, Werner von Braun and why the Americans so desperately wanted to recruit him? Yes, uh, Werner von Braun is an interesting figure. Uh, he was uh, kind of a hotshot rocket scientist. Uh, as a young man, uh, he was uh, uh, seemed to be a very brilliant, promising engineer. Uh, and uh, in his 20s, he was put in charge of Nazi Germany's uh, ballistic missile program. He always dreamed of exploring space through rocketry, but, uh, but put his talents uh, and his career ambitions to the service of the military instead. And he claimed, as you said um, later after the war, that his interest in rockets was really um, more pure, motivated by his aspirations to help uh, human beings achieve space travel. But in fact, the rockets that he um, helped to develop turned into deadly weapons. How were they used by the German military during the war? Yeah, um, we're seeing images of what was called the V2, so named um, for the German word for vengeance. This is the world's first guided missile, and it was developed specifically uh, to be a, a weapon of terror. Uh, it was very advanced technology for the time, but still very clumsy, very new. Uh, and so uh, they weren't very accurate. They were targeted not at military targets, but at entire cities. The goal was to instill terror in the enemy population. And uh, they were very effective. Uh, they caused mass destruction and uh, cost thousands of allied civilian lives. We actually have a comment from a viewer named Jenny. She writes, I'm one of the people who lived through the hell of World War II. When it started in the Netherlands, I was eight years old. I could not sleep some nights because of the rockets going over that were meant for England. But one fell one block away from us. It was a total nightmare. Wow. Wow, I can't imagine as a, as a child experiencing that. Thanks for sharing that comment. That's a, a perfect illustration of, of how uh, both how this was used to inspire fear and, and how uh, clumsy a weapon they were. Uh, Von Braun and his team knew that they didn't have this refined exactly and that there was a lot of collateral damage. And in September 1944, the first V-2 rocket was fired at London. The damage was overwhelming, as you can see in these photos taken a few months later. And the uh, destructiveness of the V-2s is one of the reasons why von Braun was so sought after by the Soviets, by the Americans, and other countries as the, war, the tide of war turned against Germany. Um, another viewer named Sidney writes in saying, when the first V-2 struck London, von Braun uh, was supposedly was said to have remarked that the rocket performed perfectly it just landed on the wrong planet. Yeah, yeah as I mentioned, he, he really had a passion for space exploration and uh, dreamed of, of someday of sending uh, uh, humans to Mars. Uh, but, uh, but his career ambitions were so great that he sought out the, uh, the greater funding and support that the military was able to provide. Still, it's hard to look at those photos and to hear the comment from Jenny and not then be struck by the callousness of him just focusing, of von Braun just focusing on the performance of the rocket and not the human toll that it inflicted. Uh, Mark, we have some Nazi propaganda photos of prisoners um, put to work on the rocket program. Didn't von Braun know that his rockets were being built on the backs of thousands of slave laborers? Uh, yes, without a doubt, he was aware of that. 
uh, he toured the facilities himself several times. And there's even evidence that he personally chose to travel to the Buchenwald concentration camp to seek out more prisoners and arrange their transfer to the, uh, the Dora Middlebau works where they were constructing the V2 rockets. Um, he wasn't you know, a primary architect of this system of the exploitation of concentration camp prisoners forced labor, but he did make decisions to, uh, to become more involved in it and to exploit it for his own benefit. Uh, he uh, described the, the conditions once, I, re I remember uh, in a later interview as, as being hellish. He, he knew how deadly and uh, how terrible the living conditions and working conditions of, of these prisoners were. Uh, and and uh, I think the figure most often cited is that approximately 20,000 concentration camp prisoners died while constructing the V-2 rockets. So a really deadly program. Um, as the war wound down and immediately afterwards, Von Braun and a group of about 100 other rocket scientists uh, gave themselves up. And the Americans, for the reasons you described earlier, were only too happy to have them. Um, Von Braun has been a much debated figure. We have a couple of uh, comments, just a sampling of the kind of debate that's happening in the comments section while we're talking. Janice recalls actually meeting Von Braun uh, at NASA um, once he came to work for the U.S. Space Agency. And she recalls him saying that all the scientists were praying the Americans would get to them first before the Russians, that they wanted to come to the U.S. rather than the Soviet Union. Um, uh, another viewer named Frederick asks, didn't Von Braun deserve the chance of redemption? He switched from designing war weapons for a dictator to moving all of mankind forward through peaceful means. So Mark, you've studied this history and you've studied Von Braun. I'd like your take on this. I mean, despite his clear complicity, how did he spin his personal history once it, uh, he wanted to move on to a different new chapter? Uh, well, he uh, portrayed himself as a kind of an apolitical scientist, you know, as, as somebody who was solely interested in developing this new technology, science for science's sake, and that he wasn't involved with the regime or its crimes. Uh, and this was this was uh, not exactly true. You know, he we discussed his involvement with forced labor. He was also a card-carrying Nazi Party member. And not just that, but he actually joined uh, the elite uh, Nazi paramilitary SS, although there's some evidence that he might have been pressured to do so. Uh, and he certainly didn't seem to share all of the Nazi party's convictions, but uh, several of their beliefs. Uh, he was a German ultranationalist. He was a committed anti-communist, and he was very happy to see uh, the Nazis' success. Uh, and became uh, critical of the regime only when it seemed clear that the war was turning against them. You said something interesting to me about uh, when we were prepping for this about whether or not he was an ideologue, like a, a true believer. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I draw that out of you? Leading question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, he didn't share all of the the Nazi regime's uh, convictions and beliefs, but some. Uh, it seems though that his overriding motivation uh, for his work uh, for the Nazi war effort was uh, this sort of personal ambition and, and his professional goals, which, you know, I almost find more troubling sometimes that people would, would throw uh, the, their expertise and all of their life's work uh, to the service of, of a regime like the Nazis, uh, even if they didn't, you know, agree completely with it, it, it and, and what it was doing. It seems uh, like he sacrificed any moral reserva reservations he might have had uh, in pursuit of his professional goals. Yeah, that he was a, a, an opportunist yes. at, in the best case scenario. So um, we've received a question from Stephen that I think allows us to address a common misconception. Stephen says uh, or asks, yes, von Braun was a member of the Nazi party. However, if you were not a member of the Nazi party, you were dead. So what choice did this man have? Uh, could you? Correct the, the correct the record a little here, please, Mark. Well, he certainly faced some pressure, um, if not to join the Nazi Party, to join the SS. Uh, but it seems that uh, that he joined the Nazi Party not out of fear of death, but out of, uh, as you you mentioned, you know, opportunism, out of this uh, sort of career ambition. Being a member of the party helped to advance his career goals. Uh, many people who weren't, uh, you know, committed ideological Nazis joined the party uh, because it would help their careers. 
because it would help them to be successful once the Nazi party took over the government. Uh, and you know, there's actually many examples of, uh, of people uh, in similar positions, academics and scientists who managed not only to survive by not joining the party or supporting its, its military goals, but uh, to even continue to work in their chosen profession and fields. And if I could take Stephen's question even a little broader, uh, I think it, it's surprising to many to know that even in cases of more direct involvement in um, crimes of, of violence, for example, in the, the mobile killing squads that operated on the Eastern Front, front um, murdering as many as one and a half to two million civilians, mostly Jews, even in those cases, uh, members were allowed to step out people who did not want to participate in the shootings, men who had shot for one day and said, I, I can't keep doing this, or who just found the whole order distasteful, um, they were not killed. They were not even punished. Um, they were usually just given a transfer because they didn't have a stomach for it. So even in those much more brutal settings, um, there was a lot more personal choice and agency. Um, it's kind of uncomfortable, I think, to, to realize that because it means that those who did so really um, we're making a, a, a deliberate conscious choice um, and not just we're forced. Nice. Um, anyway, a topic also for another show, but thank you, Stephen, for that question. Um, Mark, Von Braun eventually became the public face of America's space program. He was not working silently behind the scenes, um, but eventually his past caught up with him. Can you tell us a little bit about how this tension played out in the public eye? Yeah, uh, he was uh, very interested in uh, pushing this idea of himself as a kind of celebrity scientist. He liked being the face of the, the, the space program. He wrote magazine articles, uh, he gave interviews, he tried to have a science fiction novel published even. Uh, in the 50s, he even worked with Walt Disney uh, and starred in a, a program called Man in Space about the possibilities of, of humans exploring space. Uh, but, uh, you know, as his uh, fame grew, so did criticism. You know, he became more and more famous internationally as he became uh, the leading scientist involved in the development of the rockets that were used to, uh, to put uh, man on the moon in 1969. And throughout the 60s, the idea of Von Braun as you know, the, the Nazi scientist kind of entered the popular culture. Uh, he even began to be mocked uh, for, for that connection uh, and uh, oddly became the object of humor. In fact, we have a clip that illustrates that um, with really great biting satire. Um, the American comic uh, Tom Lehrer skewering Werner von Braun's uh, dark past. Gather round while I sing you of Werner von Braun, a man whose allegiance is ruled by expedience. Call him a Nazi, he won't even frown. Nazi schmatzi, says Werner von Braun. Don't say that he's hypocritical. Say rather that he's apolitical. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? <laughs> That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an incredible clip. That was, uh, I think, from 1965. And by that point, uh, Von Braun had begun to be spoofed. Uh, you know, the, the character of Dr. Strangelove from the famous Stanley Kubrick movie is clearly based on, on uh, the top scientist and former Nazi Werner Von Braun. And uh, he was even confronted to his face uh, with his past. Uh, there's a story that at one Apollo press conference, uh, a reporter asked him if he could be sure that after the rocket went up, it wouldn't come down and land on London. And uh, Von Braun reportedly stormed out of the conference. So his uh, past continued to haunt him, um, even as he became a national hero in, in a new place. Um, there's a question, and I don't know, I'm, I'm always, you know, as a historian, a little uncomfortable with uh, alternate history questions. What would have happened? What if? Um, but I'm curious, uh, a viewer named Susan is asking, if the U.S. didn't take these scientists, Russia would have with possibly disastrous results. Um, Bob, Mark, if each of you could just weigh in for a minute on that um, in the time before we close. I, I'll take the first stab at it. I think, uh, you know, 
Unfortunately, it didn't happen. And I don't like to look at what ifs because uh, you have to speculate. Uh, fortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, things could have been very, very different had the uh, Soviets uh, uh, recruited von Braun and the uh, and these scientists earlier. They did, however, they essentially kidnapped uh, about half of the German scientists uh, after World War II anyway. But I, I, I'll let Mark weigh in with his views of this as well. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with everything you said there. I don't like to speculate either, but uh, what we can say about what did happen is that the Soviet Union managed to recruit many uh, top German scientists anyway. And uh, it seems likely that if we had not tried to recruit them, that they would have continued to develop these technologies. Uh, but uh, one thing that I always think about uh, with this is that in many cases, American technological innovation was far ahead of the German. Uh, uh, and so while there was an edge in rocketry and they were far advanced in chemical weaponry, uh, you know, there was a lot going on right uh, right in the United States, and I'm not convinced that American innovation couldn't have you know, propelled us into the space race very successfully without the help of former Nazis. So many, many variables at play, and this is just one um, very complicated and controversial one. I wanna thank you so much, Mark and Bob, both for joining us today for this discussion. I learned a lot, and I know our viewers did too. You're very welcome. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yes. It's really interesting to think about the intersections of different secret American government efforts um, and also how these choices and um, moral compromises also shift our view of ourselves as a nation looking backwards, that it is tempting to just think of the United States as a country that was a rescuer or a liberator, but in fact, nothing is ever that straightforward. And I think this uh, helps to add some of those shades of gray. So thank you. As we approach Memorial Day here in America, we honor Rudy Pins, Paul Fairbrook, Arno Mayer, and the thousands of European Jewish men and women who served their newly adopted homeland during World War II. And we thank again, Paul and Arno's family for sharing their photographs, their personal stories with us. We also pay tribute to the sacrifices that all members of the United States Armed Forces have made over the years and continue to make today in defense of our freedoms. Viewers, we hope you will join us for our next program on Friday, June 17th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, when we'll commemorate World Refugee Day. We'll be discussing the hardships that individuals and families faced when they were forced out of their homes during the Holocaust, as well as the challenges that refugees experience in conflict zones today. We hope to see you on June 17th, and until then, wherever you are, be healthy and well. Bye-bye.